Good morning. The Seven Years' War was fought between several allied powers across the whole known world, lasting from 1756 to 1763, a total of seven years. Just making sure we can do math in this part of the country. Very good. Halfway through... George William Frederick assumed the throne of Great Britain as George III on October 25, 1760. He saw the war won with great success and expansion of the empire. He was not, as is commonly believed, a raging tyrant. The 22-year-old king was born in 1738, two months premature, and survived. 1738. That is remarkable. He would marry the 17-year-old Princess Charlotte of the Holy Roman Empire the following year of his ascension to the throne. Their wedding day was the first time they had ever met. Very lovely, yes. But King George was actually a rather faithful praying man who was faithful to his wife, and the press could not stand the man. He was boring. He made for terrible tabloids, unlike other kings in the past. He was, a very, he was just as, it was a sophisticated, educated man. He was educated in commerce, agriculture, constitutional law, Chemistry, physics, mathematics, astronomy, Latin, French, history, geography, and music. And he was also a rather accomplished writer, fencer, and yes, even a dancer. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. The press, though, were abhorred by the man's peculiarities in that when he would have time off from his duties as king, he would go back to his family estate, put on peasant clothes, and do outside work like a servant. Scandalous is what he was, just scandalous, and they could not stand him for it. His life, though, was one of great faith, Devotion, he would donate more than half of his personal income to charity. He absolutely abhorred immoral behavior, would call out people in his own administration in public for it, and was very diligent in teaching biblical virtues to his and Queen Charlotte's 15 children. 50, yes, uh, nine sons, six daughters. He was also very devoted to, extremely loyal to the empire. He found it to be, he had a profound reverence for the kingdom, believing no one person, including himself, was more important than the empire. <laughs> now, you see, you really can fit Star Wars into about anything, so you see... However, most people did have a great respect for the king because of his devotion to morality and his faith and above all to the kingdom. Now, Great Britain is in great debt because of this seven years war. You may have heard of it back here in the colonies as the French and Indian War that preceded the events we're going to be covering this week. But the everybody had prospered, had flourished through this event. There had been newly acquired territories and, and great expansion, success for all to enjoy. So since everyone benefited from the war, everyone should benefit from the wonderful privilege of getting to help replenish the treasury that won this war. So both, both England and his majesty's colonies were to be taxed. 
In fact, the motherland, England, would face the largest share of the tax burden. The taxes were all imposed with the advice and consent of His Majesty's Privy Council, his cabinet, and all through the legislative process of Parliament in perfect accordance with British constitutional law. The only problem was, back in the American colonies, as they might say in your vernacular, we ain't never done like that before. <laughs> you see, for 150 years, the colonies, who were loyal British subjects, had mostly ruled themselves, determining their own policies, including their own taxes. And Britain and the Treasury had always benefited from the trade and the commerce, so why change anything now? But the king and parliament were wise, some might say conniving, about it and how they began to administer the new changes that were to be brought. They took advantage of a political situation known as Pontiac's War or Pontiac's Rebellion. It was, yes, this is where the name comes from. It was, uh, there was a, a large group of Indian tribes who were upset that the French had lost and did not like that the British now had control, and so they had begun attacking forts and settlements and things, uh, to the point that 4,000 settlers had to flee western Pennsylvania and Virginia for their own safety. And so the king and his privy council said, well, you never let a good crisis go to waste, and so they enacted the Royal Proclamation of 1763. You can see out on the table a recreation of that proclamation. What this did was change the western boundary of the colonies. Does everybody see the map up here? Where is the western boundary of, say, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia? It's where? Off the map. It goes clear off. This was in the original charters. Because... When they began these colonies, there was great foresight, excitement at about future expansion and growth that our maps go off the chart. Because who knows how great and prosperous these colonies may be someday. And now this proclamation comes in and puts a western boundary right on top of everything. No further expansion, no future growth. But it was guaranteed in their charters. Also, because of the situation, British regulars were placed all along that western boundary for your protection, for your safety. Yet this was supposed to be peacetime. Standing armies in peacetime, that was not allowed in the British law. Also, His Majesty's officers are now going to take charge of any and all relations with the natives. Now that is something that has been greatly politicized in history, is the relations between the colonists and the natives. We're going to discuss that more in detail tonight as we look at Jamestown and Plymouth, the original settlers and the pilgrims, of which we will celebrate today with a turkey feast. Thank you. So, now, it has been great. It, just to say, it was complicated. Most of the time, it was okay. But now, British soldiers who have no clue what's going on are now going to handle all the relations between. How do you think this is going to go? Probably not very well. Well, now that that's all established, here come all of the acts or the new laws and taxes. So you began with the writs of assistance, contracts, all underneath uh, the Navigation Acts. These said that the colonies now can trade only with Great Britain, and Great Britain only. No other trade can be done with any other country throughout the rest of the world. You had to send all your goods to traders in England who will then, and, and of course there are going to be fees with that. So that was good. And by the way, if you were found to do trade with anybody else, you will be punished with prison with no trial by jury. Now, hold on just a minute. One of the great privileges of being English, of being a part of the British Empire, is that you 
above all other people in all the world have rights guaranteed in law called the English Bill of Rights. No one else in the world has that. That's why it's such a privilege and an honor to be a British citizen. But now if you conduct this one crime, you lose that right. Oh, this sends up some very alarming signals in the minds of the colonists. Are we not being treated as English citizens? Next then came the Sugar Act, 1764. It was a tax imposed on sugar, wine, coffee, pimentos, and silk, and on exports of lumber, iron, flour, cheese, and farm products. They were told, I'm sure you've never heard of this before, this is simply just a tax on the rich. Only the rich, the wealthy, the top 1% are going to be taxed here. These are those types of odds, the uh, commodities that are going to be taxed. Well, suffice it to say, you might find this rather surprising, but history has shown us that any time a government has said the solution to one's problems is simply taxing the rich, guess who inevitably gets taxed? Everyone in order to provide that which was promised through these taxes. This is why it is an American value that tax rates reflect freedom. The greater the taxes, the fewer liberties you have because the government takes more of your money and decides what to do with it instead of you. Therefore, the lower the taxes, the greater your freedom. Not to mention, there's this uh, little um, <clears throat> wrinkle in the thing. If we're going to tax only the wealthy, who gets to decide who is wealthy? The ones leveling the taxes, isn't that convenient? Well... The Currency Act of 1764 followed. It said, all the taxes, by the way, we don't trust your colonial currency, therefore they must be paid in silver or gold. Now, how many of you poor farmers out there have some gold lying around with which to pay your taxes? Hmm. There was the Quartering Act and the Stamp Act of 1765. The Stamp Act was a tax on, guess who? Everyone. It didn't take long, did it? It was a price you had to pay in order to have a new government-issued stamp placed on all papers, all your documents, your wills, your deeds, licenses, magazines, even newspapers, playing cards, so on and so forth. I actually have, for your viewing, it'll be out there on the table, uh, some items that are from the Revolutionary Era, including this dice right here. It's on the number six, and there is a red stamp on it. This is an actual stamp from the Stamp Act. You all can see back there when we have it on display. If you fail to get the stamp, it was not officially recognized. So the deed to your family farm that has been in the family since Charles II for five generations... If it does not have the stamp on it, it is null and void, and therefore it is the government's to do with as they please. This was not popular. There was such an outcry that there was actually this event called the Stamp Act Congress. People came together and voiced for the first time ever a unified voice of opposition to this. And so the parliament took notice of this and repealed the Stamp Act. Hoo, hurrah! Who thought that would happen? But parliament wanted to make sure we all had an understanding. And so they passed the Declaratory Act of 1766, which said pretty much this, hello, we're Parliament, you're colonists. We will tax you anytime, anywhere, any place, any way we want, and you will pay it. That's all it said. And they followed that with action. The Townshend Acts of 1767, taxes on paper, glass, lead, paint, and <clears throat> taxes on paper, glass, lead, paint, and 
on, I can hardly bring myself to say it. T. <laughs> they taxed our T. If there is one great lesson in history to learn, and only one, it's simply this. Don't mess with the Brits' tea. If they had simply left this alone, we may be loyal British subjects today, drinking His Majesty's brew and enjoying it. But they taxed it. And that wasn't all. The Township Acts also include the Revenue Act, the Indemnity Act, the Commissioners of Customs Act, the New York Restraining Act, and the Vice Admiralty Court Act to force compliance with all the taxes. I think they needed some 87,000 new agents in order to enforce all this. <laughs> this hit Boston Harbor very hard. As I know, shocking to you, the taxes greatly hurt their economy. It was the largest port in all the colonies, and it cost Boston a great number of jobs and a lot of hardship. Tensions built so much in Boston to the explosive events of March 5th, 1770, known as the Boston Massacre. I do not have time this morning to go into the amazing details of what took place there, only to share with you this. No one would represent the soldiers in court except for one man who believed it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what your beliefs are, no one should be deprived of their rights. And his name was John Adams, and he served as the defense lawyer for the soldiers and won the case. They were found not guilty. But everyone realized through that event just how tense the situation was, and therefore many of the taxes were repealed, except then they decided to pass the Tea Act of 1773. And what is our lesson from history? <laughs> exactly. You see, nearly half the population drank tea at least twice a day. Swedish professor Peter Kalm, back in 1748, said that tea had even replaced milk as the breakfast beverage. Now, I came into the vestibule of this magnificent facility and found not a spot of tea this morning. <laughs> Instead, you had these grinded coffee grinds and put your little flavors in them and drank them instead. Now, in order to express to you what took place here with the tea, let me put it this way for all of you in the 21st century. How would you like it? Uh, is, is anybody here a coffee drinker? Let me just see. Okay. How would you like it if the United States government came in and said, here is what we're going to do with the coffee market. We're going to take full charge of the coffee market, and we're going to produce one and only one coffee. Only one brew for you. It is a very good one, and it is a very affordable. In fact, it's cheaper than the coffee you've been drinking. But there's only one, and we decide which flavor and brew and strength and everything it is, and that is the universal one available to all of the country. Don't tell me there would not be a revolution. Would there not be? Yes. That's what they did with the tea. They took complete control of it, gave them only one option. It was a very good one, a good flavor one. It was cheaper. But who wants the government deciding what you get to drink? Especially when it came to tea. All of these things leading up to this then led to the events on the night of December 16th, 1773, when around 100 men boarded the ships, the Dartmouth, the Eleanor, and the Beaver, and proceeded to bring up from her hull 342 chests of tea, dumped it into Boston Harbor, a total of around 90,000 pounds, 45 tons. It turned the harbor brown, killed all the fish, and when the wind blew in from the east through Boston Harbor, everyone had the wonderful smell of dead fish in saltwater tea. <laughs> Very lovely, yes, indeed. 
Now, this was a crime. It's interesting, though, how they went about it and how history reflects upon it. They believed it was a political statement. In fact, they swept the decks afterward, put everything away. There was one broken lock, and they proceeded to replace that lock the following morning. However, not all saw it that way. Uh, would you like to see a picture of somebody who participated? This is David Kinnison. He was 37 years old at the Tea Party. He lived to the year 1851, long enough to see the technology of photography developed and had his picture taken. He died at the age of 115. I believe he was 111 in the photograph, if I recall correctly. This event was so costly, it single-handedly bankrupted the British East India Company. That is the largest company in the empire. Now, they had had some financial troubles leading up to that, but this event was, was more than they could handle, and it bankrupted them. To put that into perspective, does anybody know the largest employer, what company employs the, lar the, the most people in the United States today? What, what is it? it? Besides government, yes. <laughs> Amazon is second. Walmart employs 2.3 million people throughout the United States. You would have to take Amazon and United Alliance, I think is what it's called, uh, Universal Alliance, and uh, add theirs together to get what Walmart has, single-handedly. If in one night, Walmart went bankrupt, do you know what that would do to the United States economy? It would be, well, yes, I'm, besides not being able to go to Walmart, yes, I understand that. But I just stay, that was, this is what happens. Benjamin Franklin is back in England, and he has been trying to negotiate, trying to be a good voice on behalf of the colonies. When he hears of this, he, he can't believe what he's heard. How could we do such a thing? He was livid. He immediately sent as much correspondence back to the colonies demanding we pay this back. He himself will personally contribute because he is terrified of what the king's reaction might be. And they found out. The coercive acts of 1774 were implemented immediately. Massachusetts charter was revoked. All government positions will be replaced with royal appointments, no elections. General Thomas Cage, Gage will be appointed as the governor of the colony, and all trials of royal officials will now be held in England. George Washington thought that last one should be called the Murder Act because literally the soldiers could get away with murder or anything else, and their trial will be back in England. Also, Troops will now be quartered amongst the citizenry in any unoccupied building in every colony, not just Massachusetts, to prevent anything else like this from happening. And Boston Harbor will be closed indefinitely until all of the tea is paid for. Let me ask you how. What is the source of income for Boston? Trade, the harbor, yet it is to be closed until they pay it off. That was meant to crush them, to destroy them. The colonists called these the intolerable acts as they literally took away free elections, representative government, free enterprise, freedom in general, as now British soldiers are everywhere monitoring everything you do and say. Things obviously are not getting better, only worse. So, on September 5, 1774, 50 delegates from every colony except for Georgia assembled at Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia. Sounds wonderful, we're going to work together. It's not how it went. They began arguing, attacking, accusing. Massachusetts wanted immediate action. The middle colonies blamed the New England colonies for causing all the ruckus. The New England colonies were blaming the southern colonies for just sitting back and, and enjoying their prosperity while their brethren suffered and nobody cared about anybody else. And they said, ay, 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 ay. 
was quickly realized that something needed to be done in order to establish some sense of unity if anything's going to be accomplished. So Thomas Cushing of Massachusetts made a motion before the Congress that they should begin their sessions with the one thing that did unify them. How should they begin? Even more than tea. Prayer. It was agreed, and on the morning of September 7th, Jacob Duchesne of Christ Church came and began by reading the scheduled passage of the Anglican prayer book. That morning it happened to be Psalm 35, which reads, Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at mine hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. You will hear that phrase very frequently. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. Just happened to be the scheduled psalm for that day. John Adams would write to his beloved Abigail, quote, I never saw a greater effect upon an audience. It was as if heaven had ordained that psalm to be read that morning. Jacob Duchesne then prayed after reading the scripture. O Lord, our heavenly Father, look down in mercy we beseech thee on these our American states who have fled to thee from the rod of the oppressor. Be thou present, O God of wisdom, and direct the counsels of this honorable assembly. Enable them to settle things on the best and surest foundation, that the scene of blood may be speedily closed, that the harmony and peace may be effectually restored, and truth and justice, religion and piety prevail and flourish amongst the people. All this we ask in the name and through the merits of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Savior. Amen. And the prayer service would continue for two hours. In fact, by 1815, the Congress will have called on the American people over 1,400 times to pray for issues in their country. Would it not be nice for our Congress to do that today? When the Congress adjourned in October, they had agreed upon and published their Declaration and Resolves and had sent a petition to the king asking him to simply just restore things to the way they used to be and they gladly will be loyal British subjects forevermore. The following May, they would come back to see how things had progressed. Well, back in Massachusetts, British forces had begun confiscating guns and gunpowder in order to prevent any type of uprising, any militias from starting. Governor Thomas Gage was also fortifying Boston in case there was an attack. And so in response, New England residents who did not want to give up their arms, their self-defense, began to create a system of alert established by Joseph Warren and Paul Revere in which they would be able to alert people within a minute's notice of their response. We called them what? Minute men. And therefore, they'd be able to move their ammunitions whenever needed. General Gage even brought garrisons from all over the world and the country to solidify his forces. And so on the night of April 18, 1775, at 10 o'clock p.m., a British force of 900 men set out to go to Concord to seize the weapon stockpile they had found out was being hidden there. Robert Newman and Captain John Pulling go up to the steeple of the Old North Church and hang two lanterns in order for the alert riders across the Charles River to see what was going on and could go out and alert everybody as to the British movements. Eventually, the British soldiers at dawn ran into the 70 militiamen at Lexington, under the command of Captain John Parker, who the men were pretty much the members of the Lexington Church of Christ. Your regiment was usually your church. Therefore, they came out and stood in the way, these 70 men, in front of the 900, just to be a roadblock to delay them. 
British officer would ride up to them and say, In the name of his majesty, remove thyselves. Did you plant corn this year? I, I planted corn. Did you? Plant? No, you went with flax. Oh, flax. Oh, flax ought to do good. Flax is good. Yeah, I did wheat last year. Wheat was okay. Yeah, was right. In the name of his majesty's the officers, remove thyselves. Did you see George and Martha at church last Sunday? No, I didn't see him at church. Do you know where they went last Sunday? No, I heard they went down to visit her in-laws. Yeah, that's right. And this went on for I don't know how long. They just stood there. They had no intention to fight, but then somewhere, someplace we do not know to this day. A gun went off, and a British officer pointed his sword and ordered his men to fire. And the first battle bloodshed of the revolution had begun. Seven men were killed, ten more wounded. The British proceeded to Concord, where they found nothing as there had been enough time in order to move the stockpile. Now they had the wonderful journey of 19 miles marching back to Boston, being greeted by everyone who came out in response to the alert. They were greeted not with fanfare, more like gunfire. Included in some of that was preacher Benjamin Balk leading his men from Danvers and preacher Joseph Willard of the First Congregational Church bringing two companies of men. And so by the time they got back to Boston, they had suffered 73 deaths, 174 wounded, and 53 missing. The British then took siege of Boston while resistance forces began to gather and gather and gather outside of the city. Some three to 4,000 people. Where did they all come from? Well, preacher David Avery brought 20 prisoners from Vermont in support, gathering more along the way. Preacher Stephen Farrar brought 97 men from New Hampshire. Preacher Peter Mullenberg raised 300 from Virginia. And preacher John Steele raised 900 men from churches in Pennsylvania to march on Boston. Is it any wonder... That British officials absolutely despised American preachers. They would refer to them as the Black Regiment or the Black Robe Brigade due to the preachers back then wearing a black robe when they were in the pulpit. So great was their animosity that British soldiers often burnt, plundered, or seized church buildings for their own use. So when the Congress reconvenes in Philadelphia that following May, yeah, a few things have happened since then. Things are not getting any better. They send Colonel George Washington to be the general of the new Continental Army as there are now 10,000 patriots sitting outside of Boston just ready to pounce. On June 17th, the British, in order to solidify their position there, seize Bunker Hill, as you may recall, but at a very dear cost in lives. Unbeknownst to everyone during this time, Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold have led 83 men called the Green Mountain Boys to northern New York where they walk up to Fort Ticonderoga as British citizens. They're like, hello, can we come in? Sure, come on in. Very good, stick them up. And they seize the fort, and they seize all of the cannon that they are now going to take. Henry Knox leads this incredible expedition back through mountains and rivers and snowstorms to get these cannon back to George Washington at Boston so he would have them to use there. When they arrive, Washington places them over here in Cambridge. Okay, if you can see this. This is Bunker Hill over here. All of the ships are in harbor right here in Boston, okay, on this side. So they're protected from cannon. That's why they went and seized Bunker Hill. Washington wants to get all the cannon over here to the Dorchester Heights so they'll have a straight shot at all their ships. That is the goal. For several nights, starting on uh, March uh, 3rd, they begin to uh, shoot their cannons from over there at the one spot to distract them. And finally, on the night of March 4th, they begin to move all the cannon, all of their little fortifications, their little walls, their, their, uh, everything they're going to use, the parapet and all that stuff, to set up on the doorsteps. They put hay bales all along the path and on the path to try to muffle the noise of all these soldiers moving throughout the night. This was an incredible undertaking. George Washington is there. The whole time saying, remember the 5th, tomorrow's the 5th, the 6th anniversary of the Boston Massacre. When 
General Howe awakes the next morning, goes out onto his porch with his cup of tea for breakfast, takes a look up at the Dorchester Heights, and sees a cannon pointing at his face. He says, the rebels have done more in one night than my whole army could have done in one month. Washington knows he's either going to send troops up to seize it, and it'll be a bloody battle like Bunker Hill, or they will retreat. And that's exactly what they planned to do. They decided they were going to send troops up. Washington then prepares to send 3,000 soldiers across the river to come in from the other side, and they plan there, and it's just gonna, and everything's about to happen and break down. It's going to be a very, very close combat, bloody, bloody situation when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a snowstorm just blows in and blankets the whole area. This gives General Howe time to think about it, and he decides it's probably not worth fighting over Boston. Let's save our troops for another day. And they send word to Washington on March 8th that if he will let them leave in peace, they will not burn the city. And they do. They retreat. With this incredible victory... Richard Henry Lee of Virginia comes before the Congress on June 2nd and holds up this resolution that says, Resolved that these colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. State means country. That they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all the political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. On June 29th, General Howe began entering New York Harbor with 100 ships full of British soldiers. General Washington was already there building fortifications. Because New York's legislature then had to up and retreat because of this, they were unable to send instructions to Philadelphia for their delegates. Therefore, on July 2nd, 1776, 12 colonies voted unanimously to pass the resolution for independence, New York being the one abstention. On the 4th, the Congress approves a declaration to be issued to all the world to explain why we have taken this historic monumental action. Back in New York, Washington had entered the area with 20,000 men, but things did not go as they did in Boston. Losing the battles of Brooklyn, 2,000 casualties. Kipps Bay, 370 casualties. White Plains, 217 casualties. And Fort Washington, where 59 were killed, 96 were wounded, and 2,837 were taken prisoner. Washington and his council realized the need to retreat with what forces they still had. They decided they would cross the East River at night. This meant, though, that if the British attacked at night, they'd be sitting ducks. A lucky scout could stumble upon them. A loyalist could betray them. Not to mention the sound of moving 9,000 troops could give it away. Major Benjamin Talmadge of Connecticut wrote, quote, to move so large a body of troops with all the necessary appendages across a river full a mile wide with a rapid current in face of a victorious, well-disciplined army nearly three times as numerous as his own and a fleet capable of stopping the navigation so that not one boat could have passed over seemed to present most formidable obstacles. You don't say. Historian David McCullough, who just passed away a couple months ago, he reveals what took place. It was about 11 o'clock when, as if by design, the northeast wind died down. The wind then shifted to the southwest, and a small armada of boats manned by Massachusetts sailors and fishermen just happened to show up to help with the escape. In a feat of extraordinary seamanship at the helm and manning oars hour after hour, they negotiated the river's swift contrary currents and boats so loaded with troops and supplies, horses and cannon that the water was often just inches from overflowing the boats. Those still on the front lines 
kept running back and forth, uh, keeping all the fires lit in the camp and making as much noise as they could so the British would think the entire army was still there. They were moving as fast as humanly possible. One Connecticut soldier remembered making 11 trips across. That's 22 miles of rowing he did. But as day approached, there was still a large number of troops yet to cross. At daybreak on the morning of August 30th, 1776, they would all be exposed when just at daybreak, as the light began to shine, a heavy, dense fog began to settle over the whole of Brooklyn, concealing everything no less than had the night. It was a fog so thick, remembered one soldier, that one could, quote, scarcely discern a man at six yards distance. Even while the sun was up, the fog remained. It did not burn off. While over on the other side in Manhattan, where they were unloading, no fog. It was around 7 o'clock, a little later, when the last men, including General Washington, landed on the other side to safety, and the fog lifted. In one night, 9,000 colonial soldiers had escaped without the loss of a single life. The reaction of the British was one of utter astonishment. The reaction of the colonials was one of utter praise for the one who had given them the covering of life. The whole effort of freedom had come within a thread of ending as fast as it started. As I said, Washington started with 20,000 troops when he left Boston. By the time they take up camp for that winter, they're down to 2,000. Most, 90% of them had left or had been killed or captured. Many of them had just left because of the hopelessness of the cause. Five months after the Declaration of Independence, that close to losing everything. Amazingly, though, Washington and his men never gave up. Never gave up. Most of the time, throughout the next five years, as they dragged on this war, it was just one escape after the other, but they never got caught. And they just kept wearing them down and wearing them down. They got some victories eventually. There was the great victory, Christmas of 76, in the Battle of Trenton, saved the entire war effort. October the following year saw the great victory at Saratoga, New York, where, which then encouraged the French to join as allies, completely changed the course of the war. And finally then, on October 19, 1781, General Cornwallis surrendered to General Washington at Yorktown, Virginia. A miraculous snowstorm at Boston. A miraculous fog at New York. A couple more miraculous storms you'll find out about tonight with the pilgrims. All of these things leading to our American founding, it makes me think of Psalm 148 where it says, Praise the Lord from the earth, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding. This is why President Washington said in his inaugural address, no people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Every step by which they've advanced to the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency. Because they witnessed it themselves. I mean, how would you feel if you had been the beneficiary of a miraculous covering of life. Well, guess what? You can be. And you need to be. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, two historic peoples, just as historic as George and Martha Washington... They found themselves with a severe sin and death problem. They were in desperate need of life, to be covered with life. Was there any hope for them? At just the right time, it says the Lord came and provided covering for them. 
covering of skin. Something innocent had given its life so that they now could be covered with forgiveness and life to take care of their sin problem and their death problem. And this became the practice throughout history for 4,000 years. Adam offered sacrifice. Abel offered sacrifice. Abraham offered sacrifice. Noah offered sacrifice. Moses, the entire law was about offering sacrifice. Innocent life given so that we could be covered with forgiveness and life eternal. But then we get to Hebrews chapter 10, and it says in verse 4 that it's impossible for the blood of an animal to provide us with forgiveness, to save us. Why is that? Because if you recall when we were here earlier this year with some dinosaur fossils, you should have learned that in a separate act of creation in Genesis chapter 1 on day 6, Mankind was made in the image of God, separate from the animal kingdom. We are not animals. We are image bearers. Hebrews 10.4, one of the greatest refutations of human evolution. We, therefore, would need the innocent life of an image bearer to be sacrificed, to be given so we could be covered with forgiveness, to be covered with life. Well, let me think in history, has there ever been anyone who came and lived a sinless, perfect life who could give it for us? Who? Therefore, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. And that sacrifice was good enough for him to sit down at the right hand of God once and for all. That we could be covered with Christ. And that's exactly what Galatians 3 says. For all of you who have been baptized into Christ, you have been clothed with Christ. You are now covered with forgiveness and life eternal. This is a freedom. This is a liberty that has been gifted to everyone if only they are willing to accept it. And you too can be the beneficiary of a miraculous covering of life. Our wonderful Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning to give you praise for that sacrifice as we have remembered what Jesus did on the cross. And we have gathered here on the first day to remember that it was on the first day that he arose victorious over death. And therefore, we too can have that same victory through Jesus. May that be the truth in every life here this morning, that we are covered by the blood and life of the Lamb. And may we, who have been so blessed with that gift, go and tell someone else. It is our prayer and our commitment in Jesus' name. And those who are covered by the blood of the Lamb said,